אלוהינו מושיענו, אנחנו מודים לך שאנחנו יכולים לבוא בפניך, להלל אותך, גם כן לבקש ממך, הברכות שלך, על מה שאנחנו לומדים, ובאופן מיוחד עכשיו, לגבי המצב בארץ ישראל. קודם כל בשביל המאמינים בישוע בצבא ישראל. גם כן, אבא, אנחנו מתפללים לגאולה לעם ישראל, יהודים גם ערבים ביחד, שאהיה פרי ממך בדרך גאולה על ידי ישוע האדון. תברך אותנו ותדריק אותנו עכשיו, אבא, בשם ישוע המשיח, אדוננו, גאו עלינו בצדקתנו. Father, we thank you that we can come before you, that we can praise you. For you are a God who is indeed worthy to be praised, but we also thank you that you are a God that we can come and present our requests. And right now, Lord, we are requesting your intervention for Israel and the people of Israel. We are especially praying for your protection on the believers in the military, of which there are many. particularly those in combat brigades, and also that there would be the fruit of salvation as a result of this war among both Jews and Arabs. Amen. Meet with us now, Lord God, as we study your word. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. As we'll bring up in the prayer reading, we've had two Jewish believers killed in combat already. One was David Ratner and another a girl, Alina, whose parents are from Russia. She, uh, this was in the Navy, but she was killed near Gaza. And of course, we've been praying for Amitai um, Agamemnon, who's uh, still in critical condition, fighting for his life, but his limbs have been blown, his lower limbs have been blown off. Young guy, but a, a believer in Jesus. Most believers in the army volunteer for combat. They think it's part of their testimony to, to serve in combat brigades. And uh, although they're a small percentage of the country, <clears throat> a disproportionately high percentage of them serve in, in combat brigades. Um, so that's the situation. But more about that in the prayer meeting. Perhaps we need to continue with our studies now. Can we look at... The model, please, of Daniel's image. Turn with me, please, to the second chapter of the Hebrew prophet Daniel. Daniel. We are comparing the two schools of argument for a European antichrist with a Islamic antichrist. as we talked about last night. Okay. We see the image that only Daniel could understand of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, among other things, foreshadows the Antichrist, but this is a major picture of the image of the beast. I know some of you already know this. Let's look at Daniel's interpretation, beginning in the 31st verse of the second chapter of Daniel. Now remember, Daniel is the only book of the Bible that contains all three languages. The portions of Daniel that are Judeo-centric, specific to the Jews, are in Hebrew. The portions that are for the Jews and for the Gentile nations are in the lingua franca of the time, Aramaic. But in the book of Daniel, you also have the interesting phenomena of certain Greek words for things like musical instruments. So it's the only book of the Bible that contains all three languages. That is interesting and somewhat important exegetically in itself. Here we shift from the Hebrew text to the Aramaic text. My wife can read Aramaic. I can only read it a little bit. And she's not here. So we'll read it in English. <laughs> You, O king, were looking, and behold, there was a single great statue. That statue was large and of extraordinary splendor, and it was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. Awesome. 
The head of the statue was made of fine gold, its breast of arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, it's partially of iron and partially of clay, its legs, or more accurately, its feet, its feet. So the legs are both of iron, but the feet that come from the iron are a mixture of iron and a softer substance, clay. You continued looking until a stone was cut without hands and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. The iron and the clay, the bronze, the silver, and gold were all crushed at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floor, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Not our main subject today, but that stone is, of course, the return of Jesus. Okay? You want to talk about Brexit? <laughs> <laughs> the whole political, economic, and religious system of the world will crumble with his return. But notice Western civilization will be the feet it stands on. Islam will never predominate. Asia, apart from Christian Asia, will never predominate. The feet will always be Western. The Industrial Revolution began in the Western world. Okay. You talk of the economies of Asia, the growth economies. Well, look at them. With Japan. <clears throat> Japan always imitated the United States from the time of Commodore Perry. It reverted back into Japanese Shintoism and emperor worship and was destroyed. The American General MacArthur rewrote their constitution and made them a parliamentary democracy with a Western economy. Their religion, Shintoism, just became part of the culture. Japan, you, Japan is an Eastern country culturally, you would think. But if you go to Tokyo, you'll see Mickey Mouse, Disneyland, M Mickey Musa. Well, I go to, I speak very little Japanese, but we have a branch there, and I, I wait for the news to come on, and the only thing I can understand is, is baseball. They play American baseball. Literally the same game. They call it Yaku. Yaku. And they have a strange way of cheering. They have these drums, and they go on for hours. Boom, 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 boom. Inning after inning, boom, 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 same beat, and it goes on for an hour, and they love it. <laughs> they, they've got the, the, the base, where am I? Am I in the States, or am I in Asia? You know, it, it's just culturally a combination of East and West, but the economy and the government is Western. Singapore. The Pearl of Southeast Asia. Again, it's English is spoken by everybody. Everybody in Singapore speaks English. <clears throat> At least almost everybody. Um, Singapore is, again, it's Asian, and it has an Asian influence. You see in the philosophy there's Confucianism and things like that. But in the economy, in the popular culture, it's very much Western. So even the countries in Asia that are economically advanced in the Far East are Westernized. The ones who are not Westernized are much lower. You see Taiwan, Singapore, South Korea, Japan, they are much, much more Westernized. You, you would not be, um, you'd know you're in Asia, but you would not be uncomfortable visiting any of those countries. You wouldn't think you were in a different world if you went to South Korea or Japan or something like that, okay? But when you get the ones that remain Asian, like Myanmar, Burma, or somewhere like, <laughs> you're in a different world. You are very much in a different world, very much. 
very much. So, Mao realized this. He realized communism didn't really work economically. So he invited Nixon to Shanghai. <laughs> I remember my first time in China driving through a tunnel. My father used to live in Shanghai before, under, under Chiang Kai-shek before Mao came to power. Knowing my father as I did, I'd be very surprised if I didn't have a few Chinese relatives <laughs> I haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet. If you're ever on the bung in Shanghai, you see somebody with eyes like this, but a nose like this, that's my brother. Tell him I said hello. <laughs> I mean, I've been to Mexico City, and I've been to Mumbai, India, and New York City, and Tokyo. I've been to most of the big cities, Cairo. I've been to huge cities, but I've never seen anything like Shanghai. <laughs> God must love Chinese people, or he wouldn't have made so many of them. <clears throat> and what's really weird is the Indonesian Chinese, the Singaporean Chinese, the Taiwanese Chinese, they, the Malaysian Chinese, they don't trust the China Chinese. <laughs> so he knew we had to get an economy that would be nominally communist, but ideologically or practically, economically, capitalist. And China booms like crazy. Now you got this guy who's a neo-Maoist, was going back under, the, the, not the Red Book, but that kind of oppression, and China is declining economically very rapidly. They are not going to be what they were. They cannot reverse this decline. There'll be something like Japan, probably. Japan, people thought in the 80s it was, you know, Japan was going to be like the United States, and then it didn't. The four recessions in 10 years, and so, well, China's going to be like that, only more so. Okay? Okay? The diasporic Chinese are more clever in business than the Chinese Chinese, really. And then technically, the, things like microchips and things, the South Koreans and the Taiwanese Chinese are much more advanced than, than China. That's one of the reasons they want Taiwan. They, the, the really smart Chinese tend to be the ones in other countries. <laughs> and the Chinese entrepreneurs like Jack Ma got in trouble. China is not going to be what it was. Look at India. India is a big threat to China. India has ambitions of overtaking China as the economic dynamo of Asia the way China overtook Japan. China overtook Japan by virtue of its size and population. Japan, like China, has a declining population. India has a growing one. India has now overtaken China as the most populous country. India is the biggest speaking English country in the world. I got to go to India in a couple of days. You, you go to the airports like in the Hyderabad. They don't even announce the flights in Hindi. They announce the flights in English. <laughs> it's the biggest speaking English country in the world. You've got all these, you've got Hindi and all these tribal languages, but the common language is English. That for, for commerce or government or anything, it's English. That's what it is. You pick up a telephone, you need somebody to help you sort out your computer problem, you're gonna get a, you're gonna get a software engineer in, 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 in Bangalore. <laughs> India has more scientists and engineers per capita than any other country. However, it's got a big problem, the caste system. The Hindus, the Sikhs, and the Muslims don't get along. India has more Muslims then Russia has people, nearly 160 million. While the Hindus of India are friendly towards the non-fundamentalist Muslims of Bangladesh, they're friendly towards them, they're not friendly at all towards Pakistan. There is a lot of conflict inside India. The Sikhs, the Hindus, they don't like each other, and they certainly don't like the Muslims. The Hindus and Muslims have been enemies for centuries. There's a growing Christian population, particularly in places like Kerala, but also other places, and there's more Indians getting saved. But the ruling party, the BJP, does not like this. 
because the caste system, you have to understand what's happening, the dynamic. While Judaism and Christianity have an aim, a goal, a purpose in the elimination of evil, okay? The destruction of evil is the purpose of the, the Judeo-Christian scriptures. It's the destruction of evil. Hinduism requires the perpetuation of evil because of the, cast, the, the karma. If, if, if you see somebody who's hungry or poor, that's because that's their karma from what they did in a previous life. They're lucky they didn't come back as a jackrabbit or something. I'm serious. Now, this caste system, in, in rural India especially, but you also see it in cities, it's unbelievable. People who actually believe the life of a cow is worth more than the life of a baby, I've seen this multiple times. These stupid Westerners going to ashrams and gurus and, 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 and yoga, they don't even understand what yoga really is. You've got to talk to a believer from India who was saved out of Hinduism. They'll tell you what yoga is. It's being yoked by a demonic spirit to a guru. And the whole thing of the Brahmins being the head in this... Well, this is exactly what you see in Daniel's image. The head is the Brahmin and going down to the feet. But the, the poorest people are the outcasts. They have no hope or anything. The kids we take care of in our orphanage, they're from the Dalit, the outcasts. And there's no pity because it's believed that that's their karma. At least in the American South when I was a kid, the segregation was seen as racist and unjust. At least in South Africa, people said apartheid was, was bigoted and it was unjust. In India, you don't have a sense of social injustice because that's karma. It's part of their religion. It's a religion that must per perpetuate evil. Although India has an economic dynamism, it also has a built-in problem. It is not declining demographically the way China and Japan or and South Korea is another one decline, declining de demographically. Okay? India's got this other problem called the caste system. And it will, not, it will take more than one generation to change it. You look at England, also America, but let's look at England, or just think where we are. You get these people come from India. They'll open a little corner shop they will work 15 hours a day, seven days a week. They'll get their kids educated no matter what it costs. They'll get those kids educated. Within one to two generations, you see the proliferation of Indians, ethnic Indians, law, engineering, medicine, more and more professors, and certainly business entrepreneurs. You take them out of the caste system and put them in the West. They become disproportionately affluent. With the exception of Ashkenazi Jews. With the exception of Ashkenazi Jews. Asians outperform Caucasians on every kind of competitive academic exam in the American university system. The only ones who outperform them, not, not my kids are actually, are, are Ashkenazi Jews. They outperform everybody. You go to Silicon Valley, you got these people from India and also from South Korea, and they're getting visas. No problem. Going from that to a six figure job. But they're westernized. <laughs> You look at where the Asian remains culturally Asian and in Asian in religion. Man, I've been to I've been to Burma. I, I, I've been to Kampuchea and Cambodia. It's a different world with those people. In the heartland of Indonesia, okay, Indonesia has boom areas, but it has areas that are a different world. The feet will always be the West. Asia will never overtake the West as the dominant geo-economic political force of the world. The feet will always be 
the West. Okay. Now remember, observed biblically, Scripture does not make an ethnic difference between Asians and Caucasians. They are both descendants of Japhet. Japhet comes from the word pretty or beautiful, Japhet. Okay. Of the three sons of Noah, Eurasians are both descendants of Japhet. The scripture only distinguishes them, not by ethnicity, but by geographical distribution and language. Okay? We have to understand anthropology and history from a biblical perspective. It'll always be the West. Australia may be on the other side of the world with New Zealand. You can, well, before the earthquake at least, you could have driven through Christchurch, New Zealand, and you would not know you were not in Watford. If you couldn't see the Cook Mountains in the distance, you wouldn't know you weren't in Watford, England. Anywhere you go. My mother, when she was alive, she lived in a retirement village. In, it was a Jewish retirement village in Florida. Uh, near, near Donald Trump's place. Not quite as salubrious, but that area. And the, the streets were named Sheffield, you know, and Worcester. You see this in Canada. You see it all over the place. Guyana, South America, you see the thing. Western civilization will always predominate. Take any continent. You cannot go to university in Latin America unless you can read and write English. You cannot go to university in Kenya or Tanzania or Nigeria or Uganda unless you can read or write English. You cannot go to university in Israel unless you couldn't read or write English. Maybe the former French places like the Cote d'Ivoire in Africa, French maybe, but it's English. They have to accept Western culture and civilization. Even the Japanese, who are as Asian as you can get in their cultural mentality, have to have baseball and Mickey Mouse. It's just the way it is. Just the way it is. No other place will be the feet. It'll always be the West. However, iron does not adhere to clay. It is a very shallow, unstable, shaky pair of feet. Worse than mine, and I'm in bad shape. <laughs> I told somebody before, I'm going to India in a couple of days. I've been looking forward to it. I don't know how I'm going to walk on the coals now. <laughs> <laughs> now, we're only speaking here in terms of biblical prophecy. We're not speaking about anthropology per se, or race per se, or ethnicity per se or even geography per se, we're speaking only from a perspective of theology and prophecy. The feet will be iron and clay all the way to the end. Yes, you must, may see dynamic, you're seeing dynamic growth in certain areas of Africa now. Africa has always been capital poor, but mineral rich. Unfortunately, post-colonial Africa has been a failure. The Chinese are buying up those countries for $2.50. I'm telling you, you see them in Zimbabwe, they're buying everything at bargain base in, in prices all over because they want the minerals. And the Chinese, uh, the, I mean the mainland Chinese now, are completely racist. They look down upon blacks as inferior, even genetically inferior. And they don't make a secret of it. You can see restaurants in Shanghai and Beijing that says no black people. They blame black people for AIDS. They invented it in Wuhan, but they blame blacks and they won't let black people into the shops. This is true. Yet they're going there and they're buying it. <laughs> uh, yet Africa is very, very wealthy, naturally. The sons of Japheth, okay, 
the sons of Shem, the Semites, like the Jews and Arabs, okay. But then you have the sons of Ham. Ham comes the Hebrew word Hat. In terms of land mass and natural wealth, God has blessed the black races hugely. Much more in terms of natural wealth than he's blessed the other two sons of Noah. The gold bullion in South Africa, the diamonds in the Kimberley, all the way up to the oil fields of Algeria. Every kind of precious metal you can think of, uranium, Africa's got it. There is no continent that is more naturally, naturally rich than Africa. The fact that it remains impoverished is because of false religion and things like this. But you look at it. Now again, this has nothing to do with race. I was talking to a young lady from Zambia earlier. You look at the Afro-Caribbeans, the Africans of the Caribbeans. The economy of Bahamas is a very stable and prosperous economy with a higher per capita income than many Caucasian countries. <laughs> you look at the uh, Netherlands Antilles, but certainly if you look at the places like Dominica and, and Barbados, they're affluent places. If you get on an airplane in Miami or Chicago and you get off the plane in Barbados, you wouldn't feel like you're in the third world. You, you're in a place where it's an organized society with a stable economy and a stable government. It, they're better off independent. They didn't need the British. They're doing fine on their own. Okay, so why is it that, that Africans, the sons of Ham, are quite prosperous? <laughs> in one area of the world, but in Africa where you've got the witch doctors and the tribal, it doesn't, it, they were better off under the British, yeah. economically. And, I, and again, I, my family, a combination of, 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 of American, Irish, and, and Israeli, and all three fought the British for their independence. I'm no, I'm no colonialist, I'm just stating facts, okay? So you've got the sons of Ham, You've got the sons of Japheth, and then you've got the Semites, the sons of Shem. The Iranians are not Semites. They adopted the religion of their enemy. Their original religion, as most of you know, was Zoroastrianism. They followed Zarathustra. They are Indo-Europeans. They are anthropological cousins to the Germanic nations. Their mitochondrial DNA would show that they are closer to people in Austria <laughs> or something than they are to people who surround them. Arabs and Persians were traditional enemies. Somehow, they wound up adopting the imposed religion of their enemies, particularly Shia Islam. That displaced Zoroastrianism. Philosophically, at least, I don't want to say theologically, but philosophically, Zoroastrianism, Zarathustra's teaching, not the way it is now with the fire veneration and things, but the original teachings of Zarathustra, obviously, it, it, it jibes very well with what you see in the book of Esther and in the book of Daniel and with the Magi coming to see Jesus and things like this. You know, they obviously were influenced during the reign of, of, of Ahal Sarush during the time of Queen Esther and Mordechai by J Jewish beliefs. They're monotheistic. They believed that there'd be a conflict between the sons of dark and the sons of light, very similar to the Essenes and to the New Testament. Um, they were much closer to the Judeo-Christian beliefs than they were to Islam, the original religion of Zarathustra. Now, of course, it has changed and mutated into something different, but I'm talking about its, its, its origins, okay? Persians are not from the tribe of Shem, of the sons of Shem. They are the sons of Japhet. It's strange. We don't think of people who are white and people who are yellow as being related, but biblically, they both came from 
Japheth. They both came from Japheth. Okay. So, you've got these three sons of Noah. Whenever you see nations, you first go to the table of nations in Genesis 10, and then you carry that back to the three sons of Noah. It all came from them. We have to understand biblical anthropology. Now, if you don't know and you've never heard me say it, and I know some of you have, maybe some of you haven't, but for the sake of the recording, I've got to go into it. In the present woke culture, which this track by Stuart addresses, everything gets racialized along the line of skin color. I've got a group of friends who are, they were semi-professional athletes in America, and they're all black guys. And they've got a blog site for evangelizing people and things like this and, and evangelizing other athletes and things like this, many of whom are, are obviously Afro-American, Afro-Americans punch way above their weight in terms of sports, uh, professional sports and things like that. So, <clears throat> we're talking to these guys, and some people wanted to know, who contact them, you know, they were into the whole woke thing, what the Bible says about race in terms of skin color. I said, I can tell you what the Bible says about skin color. Nothing. Not one word, one partial exception, but it's always ethnon in Greek, goi in Hebrew, an ethnic nation, okay? And ethnic nations can be people of any skin color. You can have two ethnic nations of the same skin color. Nation, okay? Tribe, tribalism is a big thing in the third world, and it's a big thing in scripture. Nation, tribe, tongue, language. Going back to the judgment in the Tower of Babel. Revelation 7. When the people are gathered with the rapture and resurrection, look how it describes them. Where do they come from? They come from... Where? A great multitude. Every nation, tribe, people, and tongue. Geographical distribution? Tribal identity. I'm telling you, go to like Kenya. You'll see the Kikuyus are the Kikuyus and the Maasais are the Maasais. Tribalism is a big thing in many countries. In Mexico, you've got the Mayans and you've got the <laughs> ordinary Mexicans, but the Mayans are different. Yeah. So, geographical distribution, a tribal identity. An ethnic identity, nation, ethnon, and a language. There's only one verse that speaks about skin color in the Bible. One! And it's not talking about skin color. It's making an analogy. In the days of King Manasseh, the moral depravity of, Israel, of, of Judah became so terrible with the human sacrifices of the babies to Molech, they became so irredeemable, unsalvageable, before God gave them over to the captivity. It was so depraved, God said, you can't change. You've gone too far, you can't repent. You can't change. You can't change any more than a leopard can change its spots or an Ethiopian can change his skin color. The Hebrew word for an Ethiopian and a black African is the same word, kush, which is Ethiopia. They didn't know about the Congo or, or Zambia or anything. They only knew about Ethiopia. That was black people to them. Nubians or descendants, that, that kind of thinking. Okay, that, that's what they were. Okay. Now that verse is not talking about the epidermis or the fur of a leopard. And it's not talking about the complexion of somebody from Ethiopia. <laughs> 
It's talking about the moral depravity of backslidden Judah. It simply uses skin color or leopard skin, or leopard spots rather, as an analogy. That's the only thing the Bible's, the only place the Bible even talks about skin color is not about skin color. It's talking about something completely different. What does the Bible say about race? By race, do you mean what the Bible means by race, ethnon, nation, or do you mean skin color? Skin color. What does the Bible say about it? Nothing. Nothing. Now, if God doesn't care about it, why should we give him monkeys? <laughs> <laughs> it don't mean anything to him why should it mean something to us the man has fallen after the terrible Americans and Australians left Vietnam Vietnam had a civil war and then it had a war with China the yellow Chinese Asian communists and the Vietnamese yellow Asian communists had a war with each other. And then the Khmer Rouge, in something of genocidal proportions, I went to the killing fields and saw the skulls, oh my God, the cruelty. Like Hitler, like Stalin, that, that thing. And Mao was the same. This is the yellow doing it to the yellow. <laughs> Then the Vietnamese invaded Cambodia and they had to come <laughs> Yeah, the terrible white people are gone so the yellow people can get on with killing each other. <laughs> oh, the Irish and the British. Queen Elizabeth I said we shouldn't go into Ireland. We should leave those people alone to cut each other's throats. <laughs> they always fought each other on the basis of tribe. The Celtic tribes, they always did that. The Romans called the Irish Hibernians. My mother's family is Irish. They called them Hibernians. They said all their wars are happy and their songs are sad. <laughs> Let him. <laughs> after the reunification, after the creation of the Irish Free State in 1921-22, there was an Irish Civil War. And what they did to each other was far worse than anything that happened with the black and tans and the British. A total bloodbath. Michael Collins, the, the founder of the IRA, was assassinated by De Valera's people. Like, a bloodbath in Ireland. A, tribe against tribe. <laughs> tribe against tribe. You see these things all over the world. Yes, we have to get rid of the white English colonialists from Africa. Look what happened in Burundi. Look what happened in Rwanda, the Hutus and Tutsis. The black people massacred each other unspeakably. What happened in Biafra? What the Muslims did to the Christians in Biafra? And the, 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 using famine. Or what Mungitsu did in... It, it, I mean, Gitsu actually used starvation as a military weapon against his own people in Ethiopia. The Bible doesn't say skin color will fight against skin color. Jesus said, ethnon against ethnon. Nation against nation. You're racializing something. That's not what the Bible says is going to happen. It's not about skin color. You want to go to South Africa, read the history of the Boer War with the English and the Dutch? Oh my, do you want to talk about, the British invented the concentration camp for the Dutch, the Boer. The white against white? The most unspeakable genocide that took place in Europe before the Ukraine since Hitler was Yugoslavia. Serbs and Croats. White people. It's not about skin color. It's about ethnon. We need to have a biblical understanding of anthropology, not the one of the politicians and of racial activists and of woke culture. 
To understand what's happening, we have to have a biblical perspective of these things. Okay? Everybody understand what I'm saying? Let's continue in the book of Daniel. You, O king, verse 37, are the king of kings. Notice, whenever somebody other than Jesus is called Melech Hamlachim, king of kings, in some way typifies the Antichrist. The Antichrist will want to be proclaimed king of kings, and he builds this image. You, O king, are king of kings. Okay. To whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. As Daniel 2 tells us in verse 13, it is by him kings reign. They can only come to power if God allows it. That doesn't mean they're nice guys, but it does mean God allows it. Remember, God said the Jews would be regathered to Israel. But without Hitler and Stalin, it never would have happened. If I spent the rest of my life thinking about it, I cannot think of two more evil people than Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin. But had there not been a Joseph and a Stalin and an Adolf Hitler, there'd be no Israel. That's the reality. And wherever the sons of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the sky, he's given them into your hand. A type of the Antichrist wants to have the power Christ had. He's got the whole world in his hand. And has caused you to rule over them. You are the head of gold. Remember, in Zechariah 11, Antichrist is called God's mighty agent. An agent of judgment. You reject the true Messiah, you'll get a false one. Remember, the Lord will send a deluding influence among them to make them believe what is true. What is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 talking about? The man of lawlessness. The Antichrist will be the final antic of Satan, but God will allow it in judgment. He will allow it to set up Satan for destruction. But God will also allow it as an instrument of judgment to prompt his own people to repent in desperation because nothing else worked. Except for the remnant who repent and believe the gospel. After you, there will arise another kingdom inferior to you. Then another third kingdom of bronze, which will rule over the earth. Another king inferior to you, then another third one. Then there will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron. Okay. Inasmuch as iron crushes and shatters all things, so like iron that breaks its pieces, it will crush and break all these pieces. In that you saw the feet and toes partially of potter's clay and partially of iron's clay. It will be divided, but it will have in its toughness of iron inasmuch as you saw the iron mixed with common clay. As the toes of the feet were partially of iron and partially of clay, so some of the kingdom will be strong and portions will be brittle. And in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they will combine with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. In those days, the kings of God of heaven will set up which has never been destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It'll crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but in itself it'll endure forever. This speaks of the millennial reign of Christ and beyond. 
Inasmuch in verse 45, as you saw, the stone was cut out of a mountain. Mount Zion, without hands it shall crush the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God of heaven is made known to the king. What will take place in the future so the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy? This is an outline of two things, actually three things. It is an outline of human history, how it will culminate and climax. It is an outline of the ultimate fate of the Jews, Jewish history. And it is an outline of what theologians call Heilsgeschichte, salvation history. God's plan for salvation, involving the believers, the church, and so forth. Three things. It's all here in these images of this Nebuchadnezzar. Now, the head is Babylon, gold, gold. That's what the world wants. But understand the meaning of gold. We associate it with wealth, and there's a truth in that, but gold is a non-corrosive metal. That is why in temple typology, you see the further you go into the Holy of Holies, the more precious the metals become. It goes from bronze associated with sacrifice to silver, which is associated with ransom, salvation, money. The Hebrew word for money and silver is the same word, kesef. And then the Holy of Holies, everything's gold. It's non-oxidizing. The gold endures forever. It speaks of that which is eternal. Fallen man wants eternal life on his own terms. Just like the pyramids. The pharaohs of Egypt wanted to take it with them. Okay? Fallen man has always wanted to attain eternal life on his own terms. That's the mentality of the world. You look at people. They live, there's people who've lived to accumulate money as if they can take it with them. The older they get, unless you're, a, unless you're a saved Christian, unless you're a saved believer, the older you get, the less you have to live for. Unless you are truly born again and following Christ, the older you get, the less you have to live for. Now, if you're a follower of Christ, the older you get, the more you have to live for. But if you're not a believer, the older you get, the less you have to live for. Believe it doesn't matter how much guilt you have, you're not taking it with you. Not as they think. You can build a big mausoleum for yourself. You can build a Taj Mahal or whatever you want to do. But you're not going to live in eternal luxury. Unless you believed in Christ. Truly. Fallen man does not want to corrode. He does not want to go into organic decomposition in a grave. They tried mummification in Egypt. <laughs> They've always tried to do stuff like this. It doesn't work. The only way to beat it is the resurrection. The only way to beat death is to put your faith in the one who already defeated it, Jesus. It's the only way to beat it. The Greek word uh, is a very interesting one. It means to render inoperative. To render inoperative in Corinthians. He renders death inoperative. It doesn't mean somebody can't die. It just means that you can't. It's like, as I always say, blowing air into a... a, a a ball, a rubber ball, pushing it under the water in a swimming pool. Well, you can put the ball under the water, but it's going to pop up again. The law of gravity is superseded by the law of buoyancy. The Greek word is katargeo, katargeo. One law supersedes another. The law of life in Christ supersedes the law of sin and death. The way that the law of buoyancy in physics supersedes the law of gravity. He renders it inoperative. That's the only way to beat death, unless you get raptured, which is just another aspect of the same thing. That's the only way to beat it when you snuff it. It doesn't matter what the others do, but they're going to try. The world wants a head of gold. It wants to think that it has perpetual immortality, but it doesn't. 
Then comes the silver. Two arms. Media, Persia. Media and Persia. The Medes are the anthropological ancestors of the modern Kurds. One of the problems with those who argue for an Islamic Antichrist is this. This is one of their problems. They stereotypically say when the Bible prophesies about certain nations, it's not speaking about their anthropology, only about their geography. In other words, when the Bible speaks about Libya, which was called put in the Bible, it doesn't matter if Libyans are mostly Arabs now. Before that, they were mostly not Arabs. They were mostly Indo-Europeans. They were mostly Berbers. <laughs> or they say it doesn't matter now. You know, the Gazans are the Philistines, they're the Palestinians. It, they're Arabs now. It's only a prophecy about Gaza, about Philistine. Gaza is the actual Philistine, that the Roman, the Philistine is, is Philistine. Palestinian comes from this Latinization of Philistine. The Romans named the whole place Palestine, but originally Philistine was just a Gaza Strip. Oh, it's a prophecy only about the people in Gaza. It doesn't matter that they're Arabs. The original Gazans were, again, Indo-European. They were, they were from Greece. They worshipped the fish god Dagon. They didn't worship Allah. And so those people who argue for an Islamic Antichrist just say it's a prophecy about the geographical nation, not about who lives there. This is a big problem. In that case, we can say the Iranians, the Persians, later known as the Parthians, it doesn't matter if they're Iranian or not. Well, yes, it does. It's the same geographical nation and the same ethnic nation, or at least their descendants. And then there's Israel. The Palestinian Authority, Fatah, claims that it's all Palestine because Israel has been inhabited by Arab Muslims. So we're the people of that land, not the Jews. The ethnicity of the original inhabitants don't matter. <laughs> So you're going to write Iran off, and you're going to write Israel off. It's, it's a bad argument. The Bible is clear. Nation, people, tribe, tongue. You have to count the geography and the ethnicity and the ethnic ancestry. You can't separate the two the way our friends who argue for an Islamic antichrist do. I'm not saying they don't have other arguments that are credible. We looked at some last night. I'm simply pointing out that there are, it's, it's not Edom cheese or Hauda cheese or, or Yorkshire cheddar cheese, it's Swiss cheese. There's holes in it. It's Jarlsberg with holes in it. It might taste good, but there's a bit missing, you know. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. You can't separate the two. The scripture puts them together. Nation, people, tribe, and tongue. You've got to look at it from a biblical perspective. Now, there were Arab nations in the Bible that were in opposition to Israel. Certainly, the Edomites, certainly the Moabites, but they were considered to be the lands to the east. Remember, there's a list of prophetic promises of God for the Arab descendants of Abraham, the same as there are for the Jewish ones. That's overlooked. The Arab nations, like the Jews, began with 12 princes. 
And he's given them all this land to the east. But remember Esau despised his birthright? Esau is still despising his birthright. God has given far more land, far more people, and far more wealth to the Arabs than he ever gave to the Jews. But they covered this little place smaller than New Jersey. <laughs> Small, <laughs> this little place. They covered this little place. All that land, all those people, and all of that petro wealth, etc. God has blessed the descendants of Ishmael and Esau a lot more than he's blessed the descendants of Isaac and Jacob from Abraham. Far more. But he always despises his birthright. This goes back to this. Well, let's look. So, you've got this. Then they tried to make a combination in the seeds of men. Multiculturalism does not and cannot work. Just look at it. You have Suella Braverman. She's an Asian. But she's as British as the king. <laughs> Maybe more so. She accepts British identity. She accepts her loyalty is to Britain. Even though she's an Asian, she's more loyally British than many people who are Anglo-Saxon or Anglo-Celtic. Okay. But you've got a first minister of Scotland who's a Muslim, a, Lond a mayor of London who's a Muslim. You've got somebody worshipping demon idols in number 10. It doesn't work. It's never going to work. It can't work. It will never work. Multicultural states have always failed. At best, they break up peaceably the way Yugoslavia did into the Slovaks and into the, you know, the people in Prague as opposed to people in Bratislava, the Czechs. It can break up peaceably, like after the Velvet Revolution, as it was called in. in but it usually doesn't happen that way. It usually happens the way it happened in Yugoslavia. <laughs> Tito made this multicultural, multinational, multi-ethnic state. Look at the UK. It was only because of the common fear of Roman Catholicism that Scotland, England, Wales, and Northern Ireland united. It was only because of the danger of Bonnie Prince Charles and the Pope and all of this stuff. The Celts and Anglo-Saxons never got along all that well. You see it. When the Irish and the Welsh have a soccer game or a rugby game, it's a friendly match. I went to a rugby match once when Scotland was playing England. And I remember the, the guy, yeah, hey, put your skirt on, you Scottish poof, you know, <laughs> all this, <laughs> all this hostility. It may express itself through sports rivalry or something, but it's always been there. The only thing that held Britain together was Protestantism. But Protestantism is spiritually and doctrinally dead. The only place, a strain of it still exists is Northern Ireland, basically. And look what happens up there. Federalism doesn't work. Multiculturalism does not work. There were nations, peoples, tribes, and tongues. It doesn't work. Unless you hold it together by force, or by some religious conviction. The Holy Roman Empire did not last. 
the nation state was born. Okay. They don't last. Soviet Union did not last. It just doesn't work. Now you can have the Roman emperors holding it together by force. You can have a Marshal Tito or a Joseph Stalin holding it together by force. But sooner or later, the force weakens and it implodes and divides. It just doesn't work. The only thing that can work is the unity in Christ. Nations that will somehow subscribe to a common faith. That's why the UK, I'm not, that Protestantism then was much more biblical than it is now. Okay? Much more than it is now. And they stood together in their common fear of the papacy. Their, their common faith. We have to put the fact that the Celts and Anglo-Saxons don't like each other aside. The Pope's coming after us. We have to preserve our faith in things like this. That's what they did. But it was only a common enemy. Don't forget, even the English Puritan Calvinists and the Scottish Presbyterian Calvinists massacred each other in the name of Christ. They're good Protestants. <laughs> it doesn't work. Look at these countries in Africa, post-colonial Africa, whose ever tribe has the president or whatever, they're going to get the money. The others are going to get nothing. <laughs> Africa runs that way. It just doesn't matter where it is. It doesn't work. It's never going to work. You want to see real apartheid? I'll show you real apartheid. Go to Malaysia. Malaysian Chinese and Indians, from, from Indi families from India originally, and Malaysian Chinese. You want to go to university? I don't care how high your grades are. Go to university in California. Go to university in New Zealand or Canada or Australia. You can't go to university here. You're not a Muslim. Even though apart from oil, apart from oil, most of the economy of Malaysia is run by Chinese and Indian business people. <laughs> Apart from oil, they're the ones who run the businesses. You want to send your kid to university? Put them on a plane to Sydney or Los Angeles or something. That's what they, it's apartheid. But of course it's Muslims doing it so they don't call it apartheid. 22% of the university students in Israel are Arab. That, that's apartheid. <laughs> Unbelievable hypocrisy. You couldn't make it up, but that's the way it is. They tried to make it combine in the seeds of men in desperation, but it doesn't work. That is why the pro-Europeans were so ecumenical. The only thing, as I've said before, that a Slav from Poland, or a Celt from Ireland, or somebody Germanic from Austria, or somebody of Latin descent from Portugal have in common was Roman Catholicism. They needed some kind of artificial glue to hold it together. But not only does the seed of men not combine with one another, unless they have a strong faith-based conviction, that only works in Christianity. It does not work in Islam. Most jihads are Muslims fighting other Muslims. Remember, Ishmael's seed will always be divided in Esau's sword against his brother. One of the reasons Arab Muslims particularly hate Israel and hate Christians is because the only basis of unity they have, the only basis, is a common enemy, otherwise they kill each other. Yeah. Again, the bloodbath that happened in Gaza between Hamas and Fatah, Fatah. They had a similar civil war in Lebanon, Black September in Jordan. These were 
absolutely bloodbaths, much worse than anything with Israel. The Israelis try to limit civilian casualties. The, the, much, nobody says anything. Islam, particularly Arab Islam, needs a common enemy, but they have no idea it's because of what it says in Genesis. And until they turn to Christ, it's always going to be like that. They can't even unite with each other. But let's look. Let's look. And again, it's anywhere. You know, what happened with the Hutus and the Tutsis and Burunda, it was un unbelievable what they did. Unbelievable. Genocide. And the United Nations twiddled its thumbs. And when it was over, and they said, tuss, tuss, tuss. they only yell when it's Israel fighting for its survival. How many UN resolutions passed against China for Tiananmen Square? None. But let's look. The other thing that won't work is iron and clay. So they don't adhere. So, you've got the Media Persians, silver, case of wealth. Survival is the number one human instinct. Not to die, perpetuation of longevity. Granting of eternal life by man's hand instead of God's. Something man's hand can never do. Only the hand of God can do it. That's gold, that's the top. Then comes wealth and might. Love of money and military power, military strength. That's the second thing, that's the silver. But then you've got something that comes next is bronze. The waist. The pelvis, the location of reproductive organs. Greek civilization is the seminal influence on Western civilization. They say Greco-Roman. Caesar Augustus came along and tried to make Rome the new Athens. Remember, ultimately, following Archimedes and all that in, in Syracuse, the Romans conquered Greece militarily. The Greeks conquered Rome intellectually and culturally. The Greeks conquered the Romans intellectually and culturally. The Romans conquered the Greeks militarily. Okay. That's the way it happened. Okay. The seminal influence came from the Greek world. Philip of Macedonia organized military regimentation. He had Aristotle tutor his son, Alexander. Alexander ultimately defeated the Persians, as predicted by Daniel. His empire fragments into the four generals and so forth, most particularly being Ptolemy and uh, Seleucus. Actually, there was a fifth, but the fifth was a break away from one of the fourth from Seleucus. But there was four that turned into empires, and that's the four Daniel talks about. So that happens, and then you get the legs of iron. Notice the distinction between the legs and the feet. The Roman Empire had two legs the Latin-speaking West and the Greek-speaking East. The Adriatic Sea and the Balkans were the groin. <laughs> it's where the two legs conjoined. Throughout history, the Balkans, the area to the east shore of the Adriatic Sea opposite Italy, that is always where the Islamic world, the Roman Catholic Latin world, and the Greek 
Eastern Orthodox Byzantium world conflicted. To this day, Serbs, Croats, Kosovo, Muslims. To this day, Bosnian Serbs, the Kosovo, and the Croats who were Catholic. The Ustashis were the Roman Catholics. They supported Hitler. They were Nazis. The Serbs, they were Eastern Orthodox. There was a slaughter of three quarters of a million Serbs by the Croats. This didn't happen out of a vacuum. Tito suppressed it all. Where did World War I begin? Remember, more British soldiers were killed in World War I than World War II. It was the blitz and the civilian casualties that made World War II worse. I lived near Brookwood Cemetery, biggest military cemetery in the world. Whole families, nearly whole villages of people wiped out in Britain because of World War I. You go to these cenotaphs and memorials in, in these towns in England, and you see most of the time it is World War I that has more dead than World War II. <laughs> it was unbelievable. Where did that begin? Sarajevo, Bosnia. Archduke Ferdinand, assassinated by Giovello Princip. World War I begins there. It's always been there. When the Muslims tried to invade Europe, they reached Vienna. They had to come up through the Balkans. They were stopped by the Poles, Jan Sobieski. The Poles saved Western civilization at that point in the 16th century. It's always been there. Always. That's where the three conflicted. To this day, it's where the two legs can join. That's the groin. The Adriatic and Balkans is the groin. Two legs come together, right? Then you get the eastern half. The western half turned into the Holy Roman Empire. Western Europe. The eastern half was the Byzantine Empire. Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox. Six of one, half a dozen of the other. Two variations of idolatry pretending to be Christianity. But they still never got along with each other. <laughs> and they are, there they are. Two legs. The Roman Empire. The reason Constantine eventually moved his empire, his capital from Rome, to Istanbul, to Constantinople, was because he was trying to put the center of power in the east to stop the fragmentation. You can only pull two legs, even if you're a prima ballerina, you can only <laughs> stretch your legs so far. For, even a contortionist can only stretch your legs so far before they begin to rip off. I mean, it's amazing what these contortionists and ballerinas can do with the splits and everything. I'm not saying, I, I'm not impressed by it, but you can only go so far. <laughs> you can only go so far. You can only stretch so far. Pelvic arch on a female is greater than 45 degrees. On a male, it's more natural. It's uh, smaller. It's women can facilitate childbirth. You put a, a male through childbirth, he, I don't care if he's a rugby player, he'd be out for the season. <laughs> it's a very fragile articulation. <laughs> And it's split. These tensions are always there. It had its parallel in Israel between the northern and southern kingdoms of Israel and Judah, the ten tribes and the two. Powerful leaders like David were able to keep a lid on it and cement it and unify it. But the schism would always come. Now there are other prophecies that says there'll be one again, and that's happening now. Those prophecies are being fulfilled in part, at least now. But you've always had this thing. When the schisms are there, there's always going to be schisms. There's always going to be schisms. In Quebec, the French Canadians are never going to get along with the... It's just not going to happen. It's just not going to... You go to Quebec. My, my daughter speaks Parisian French. She makes fun of my ridiculous Quebec French. But that's what we learn in New York because it's close to New York. You go to Quebec, and if you are from the Western provinces, they won't want to talk to you in English in a shop or something. 
If you're from the States, that's okay. You're a tourist. They'll talk to you in English. But they don't like talking to other Canadians. In, 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 in. Je suis français. Et tato français ici. We're, we're, we're a French state. That's what they want. They just don't get a... They're never gonna. It's not gonna happen. Remember the distance from... New York to London, culturally, is closer than the distance from Dover to Calais. <laughs> I don't care if you build the Channel Tunnel. <laughs> the distance from New York to London is always going to be closer than the distance from Dover to Calais. That's it. It's always going to be like that. Because of what it says in Daniel. We have to understand geopolitics and historical anthropology from the perspective of Scripture, or you'll not understand prophecy. Okay? So, the feet are different now. The feet are completely different than the legs, even though they come from the legs. The way Rome came from Greece, culturally, the feet come from the legs, but they're different. The legs were iron. The Roman Empire was strong. The feet are weak. I am not saying the ten toes are ten countries in the, the EU. There are other explanations that are just as plausible, even more so, because there's 25 or six countries in the EU. But, let's understand something. There's the EU and there's the EU. There's something you only see academics and certain journalists in journals talking about. That's the Western European Union. The ten countries in the EU that are also members of NATO. That's the iron. The ten EU countries that are also NATO members. Holland, France, Italy. Okay, the ten. Or 10 global trade blocks. <laughs> Comic-Con. There used to be NAFTA, the EU, whatever it is. Okay, there are other explanations. But it must come somehow from the Roman Empire. Iron and clay. The feet are iron and clay. No matter how you interpret or understand the toes. Romania. Poland, Hungary, they are never going to have the political or economic power of Germany and France and Italy. There's always going to be the iron and the clay. They do not adhere to each other. You're never going to make Slavic countries adhere to Germanic countries, adhere to Anglo-Celtic countries adhere to Latin countries. You're never going to make the countries of Western Europe that came from the Roman Empire adhere to the ones from Eastern Europe. Just look now. The, the, the people in Poland and Hungary, the, the, the Poland, they don't want Islamic immigration. You think we want what you've got? Look what you did. They're different, aren't they? But Western Europe controls the wealth out of through Brussels. You won't, you won't get your bribe. The Republic of Ireland, buy Patty a pint and he'll sign anything. <laughs> that, yeah. that country sold itself down the river to Brussels. This is what happens. Iron does not adhere to clay. Now somehow it would appear when this thing keeps on crumbling something has to happen. But turn with me to Daniel chapter 7.
we see the vision of the ram and the goats. But we also are introduced to the ten horns. But before that, in verse 1 of Daniel 7, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream. Notice he sees them both during the Babylonian captivity. Daniel saw a dream and visions in his mind as he lay on his bed, and he wrote them down. And related the following summary of it. I was looking in my vision by night, and behold, four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, which would have been the Mediterranean, and the four great beasts were coming up from the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had the wings of an eagle. I kept looking until its wings were plucked and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet now, like a man. And a human mind was given to it. Another beast, a second one, resembling a bear, and it was raised up on one side and three ribs in its mouth, and behold its teeth, and they said, Arise, devour much meat or much flesh. And I kept looking back at another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings. Again, like Alexander's empire was fragmented into four. Leopard being Greece. And the beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it. And I kept looking in the night visions and a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying, extremely strong. And it had iron teeth and it devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet. It was different than the others that were before it and it had ten horns. Well, I, and this keeps coming up in the book of Revelation repeatedly. While I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them. The three of the first horns were pulled out by its roots, and behold, this horn possessed eyes like a man and made a mouth of uttering boasts. And I kept looking until the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture was white like snow. This is a Christophan appearance of Christ, like in Revelation 1. His hair like pure wool, his throne was ablaze with flames, its wheels a burning fire, a river of fire was flowing, and coming out before him, thousands upon thousands were attending him. And myriads upon myriads standing before him, and the books were open. And I kept looking at the sound of the boastful words the horn, the Antichrist, was speaking. And I kept looking until the beast, the beast was slain and its body destroyed, given to the burning fire. And for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, but the extension of life was granted to them for an appointed time. Something else is going to happen. Anyway, you've got the same thing. And it goes on talking about these horns even further. The ten horns and then one on its head on verse 20, and the other horn which came up and before them three fell, etc., etc. That horn had eyes and a mouth uttering great boasts, which was larger in appearance than its associates. This is talking about the Antichrist. Now notice there are also four beasts in Daniel 7. But they're not like the four in Daniel chapter 2. Now let's look at this just a little bit further. In the beginning of Daniel, okay, the decree went forth that they would make this statue, okay, and at the sound of the instruments, Everyone had to bow down before it, okay? Everybody had to bow down before it. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would not in chapter 3. Now look at chapter 3, this image. Its height was 60 cubits. It's width 6 cubits. My apologies to those who know this. I'm going to count in Hebrew. Achad, shtaim, shalosh, arba, hamesh, shesh. Aramaic is very similar. Now in Hebrew, 
you say 60 by pluralizing six. Sheshim. Six, shesh. 60, sheshim. Aramaic, shethim. So it is six, sixes, six. It comes to, again, this is in the Aramaic text. Six, six, six. Okay. It gets very dangerous that the moment you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, the bagpipe, and all kinds of music, you have to fall down. Notice music is the signal. Music is the signal to worship. Jesus warned, do not repeat empty phrases as the heathen do. We've warned about this many times. A lot of these chorus things like hell song. Uh, and they sing this, the lyrics are unscriptural and they sing the same, the 7-Eleven. They sing the same seven words 11 times. This has a mesmerizing effect. Jesus said, don't do it. If you talk to someone saved out of Hinduism, they will tell you it is a mantra. A mantra. Jesus said the Father wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. If the lyrics are not biblical, like the river song from Pensacola, it's a piece of garbage. God does not accept it as worship. Spirit and in truth. If it's the Holy Spirit, it's going to be biblically grounded lyrics. One of the first people to promote unbiblical worship was Augustine. He promoted a lot of things, but he got into the pneumocentric worship of the Holy Spirit outside of the Trinity. It goes way back to that time, fourth century. Okay, God does not accept it. False religion uses music to manipulate people. If you read the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, after the law, after the Torah, after the scripture was read, the people worshipped. What you have in false religion, including false Christianity, you throw the word out the window and just worship. There's people who get, like this guy who just got caught, I've warned about him 30 years ago, Mike Bickle. He just got, finally got caught, he got nailed for immorality. I've been warning about that guy over 30 years, as you know. The whole thing with that guy, the people who went to IHOP and all these things, the hell song and that, they get their theology from singing. Not from exposition of scripture or exegesis, they get it from singing. These cliche type lyrics that are very often not even biblical and they just keep repeating them. It is brainwashing, except some of them don't have any brains, but it's brainwashing. <laughs> it's mesmerizing, mesmero in Greek. It is repeating empty phrases as the heathen do. Jesus said, commanded, don't do this. Music is a master manipulator. I've seen secular pop stars be able to do this. I've seen Mick Jagger do this. I've seen David Bowie do this. I've seen people do, do, be able to do this in the pop music industry. I've seen them. But when you bring it into a religious dimension, now you're talking about spiritual seduction, not just the use of music to psychologically manipulate somebody. Now you're talking about spiritual seduction and Antichrist is going to use it. Bow down when you hear the music. They respond not to the word, but to the music. And they think it's the Holy Spirit, but it's not the Holy Spirit, it's another spirit. So we go back to Daniel 7, and although it is four from which the Antichrist comes, 
they appear concurrently. They appear as one animal having the anatomical properties of four different animals. Okay? You get leopards, you got the birds, you got the bear. You got the Although it does have a correspondence to what you see in chapter 2, although that's there, it's concurrent. It's not going to be Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome. It's going to be some kind of amalgamation of false belief, false gods that are somehow fused together politically and probably economically. You understand? It'll be one big monster. It'll be interfaith. It won't be one after the other. It's going to be an amalgamation that the Antichrist is going to get control of. So this presents us with a problem or a question, but it's a problem for those who are saying, no, it's European, or no, it is Islamic. Why are the two mutually exclusive? What if it was a panoramic beast? Islam is overrunning Europe, isn't it? You've got the Pope calling the Muslims the first of the brethren? <coughs> what was Muhammad's daughter's name? <coughs> Fatima. <coughs> Fatima. You see the way it's going. Then you've got false brothers Maybe backsliders, maybe they were never saved, I don't know, but men of Satan. Brian McLaren and Tony Campola being two. You've got people talking about Chrislam, yes. hybriding Christianity with Islam. Yes. You see people trying to unite the Islamic countries with Europe. You see people trying to unite the world's religions. You see people trying to combine the seed of men. What they're doing is precipitating the advent of this monster in Daniel chapter 7, which has relationship to his earlier visions, but is different and is somehow concurrent. You understand? They're thinking the wrong way. They're thinking East or West. They're thinking Muslim or European. It goes beyond that. How much time do I have, Beryl? Any? If you were to take the two legs of the original Roman Empire, remembering the Adriatic is the groin when they come together, 60% of the original Roman Empire, apart from Israel, is now Islamic. where Carthage was, North Africa, Libya, Egypt, around most of Lebanon, up Syria, Turkey. What do you have? 60% of the Roman Empire is now Muslim. You understand? Oh, it's European. It comes from the Roman Empire. Yeah, but wait a minute. 60% of the Roman Empire is now Muslim. 
and you've got growing Muslim populations in Britain, but it's more so. You go to Rotterdam or Paris, you wouldn't believe it. You wouldn't believe it. You walk through the most salubrious neighborhoods in London. You walk through, I'm telling you, you walk through Mayfair. You walk through, um, the, you know, anywhere like that almost. Particularly the upmarket places like Knightsbridge or Belgravia. You'll see it's mostly Muslims walking around. Many of them affluent. You go, you, you go up Edgware Road, you, you wouldn't, you think you were in the Middle East. Whole cities like Bradford. Probably most of Birmingham, from what I can see. So it's not only 60% of the Roman Empire is Muslim. You have the Islamic colonization of Western Europe and Britain. Dublin, Ireland, overrun with Muslims and radical ones. You see what's happening here. So the people who argue for a European antichrist that has to come from the Roman Empire, you're not understanding the reality. <laughs> 60% of what was the Roman Empire is now Islamic. Only Israel's holding out. That's why Satan wants, one of the reasons Satan wants to get rid of it. The rest <laughs> has to be Muslim. But then you have the Islamic colonization of Western Europe. The huge mosque in Rome, in Madrid, everywhere. Everywhere. Paris, the whole band of Paris. Paris is surrounded by Muslims. Paris is an enclave surrounded by a ring of Islam. This is what's happening. So I can understand, on one hand, this seems to support those who say there's an Islamic Antichrist, plus things like the beheading and all that. On the other hand, you've still got the horns. Where do they come from? This is the question. Those arguing for an Islamic Antichrist, look at Zechariah 12, a familiar passage to most of you. We'll end soon. We have to take a break for the prayer meeting. The burden of the Lord concerning Israel, thus says the Lord who stretches out the heavens and lays the foundations of the earth, forms the spirit of man within him. I'm going to make Jerusalem. Remember the issue is Jerusalem. This whole thing you see even now in Gaza, they're saying that, that it's because of Al-Aqsa, yeah. the Temple Mount. Yeah. Remember, Jerusalem is where Satan got his biggest defeat and is where he gets his final defeat. I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling to all the people around it. Who's around it? Arab Muslims. Isaiah 63, 1 and 2. Same thing. Arab Muslim nations. Micah 5, verse 6. The Assyrians, the Assyrian with the definite article is a type of the, the picture of the Antichrist. And then they get in to Gog and Magog. Should we stop there, Beryl? What time is it? Tell me what to do. Shall we continue? Yeah, because it's it on the way. All right. Then this argument 
over which Antichrist it is becomes extended to Gog and Magog. And they point out the following. It is correct to say there is nothing linguistically or historically that says Rus is Russia. But bear in mind, Russia is another country with a declining population. There is one demographic in Russia that is growing. Guess who it is? The Muslims. Putin has got a Muslim problem of his own. A lot of these people fighting in Ukraine are Muslims. They already had a war with Muslims in Chechnya. This whole thing, the Goro Karabakh, another tragedy. But there's no proof that Rosh is Russia, none. These other seven nations in Ezekiel 38 and 39 are all Muslim today. All of them. Every one of them. This seems to strengthen their hand. And for the last 400 years, particularly 300 years, many people have believed that Gog, who comes from Magog, is a picture of the Antichrist. Many credible people have believed this. Many credible people have believed this. And these will be the armies of Antichrist. Now, as we've been telling people for a number of years, but no matter how many times you say it, it seems to be put on the back burner. People don't deny it, but they just don't seem to take it into much account. They're always looking, is this Gog and Magog? Is what's happening now Gog and Magog? I've said 10,000 times, and I'm not the only one, but I'm one of a relatively small number of people who pointed out we always interpret the Old Testament in light of the new. Before you look about anything now in terms of Gog and Magog, understand that that is not what Ezekiel is mainly talking about. People have said, well, because they're clearing up the battlefield for seven months, it can't be at the end of the millennium. There must be two battles of Gog and Magog, they say. Okay, they make that point. But let's look at the text. Ezekiel 37. The book of Revelation tells us That at the end of the thousand year reign, Satan in verse 7 will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. Gog and Magog, and that could be translated differently. Gog from Magog. Okay. To gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the sea and they attack Jerusalem, and the devil who deceived them is thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are. Notice, the Antichrist and the false prophet are already in the lake of fire. So if the Antichrist is Gog, <laughs> How can he be part of this Gog and Magog battle? Satan does this. The Antichrist and false prophet are already in the lake of fire. They don't come. Satan is bound. He's released. But the Antichrist and false prophet are the first people in hell.
That's a problem for them. But the first problem is, this is what the New Testament says Gog and Magog mainly is. You're looking at the wrong Gog and Magog. Okay. Now, the millennial reign of Christ is going to be an idyllic world. And it follows the resurrection of the righteous. Ezekiel 37, what happens? The flesh comes on the bones. In the valley of dry bones, it is a picture of the resurrection, isn't it? Verse 13 of Ezekiel 37. Then you'll know I am the Lord when I've opened your graves and caused you to come out from your graves, my people. I'll put my spirit within you and you'll come to life. That's the first resurrection. Yeah, he brings the Jews back to the land, but that is going to happen in the millennium, isn't it? Read Ezekiel. They'll no longer defile themselves with their idols. Is the Gog and Magog battle going to turn the Jews to Christ? Then it would have to be the same as the battle of Zechariah 12. You have to make that argument. If you're right, you've got to make that argument. They'll live in the land I gave to Jacob, my servant. It didn't go to the descendants of Esau or Ishmael, in which your fathers lived. I will make a covenant with them. It'll be an everlasting covenant with them. Did that happen in Zechariah 12? <laughs> Read, two-thirds of them wind up getting wiped out after Christ <laughs> comes with the rapture and they look upon him and they appear. Two-thirds of them get killed. It doesn't add up. The nations will know I am the Lord. The nations come against Israel. They don't turn to Christ. Then chapter 38 and 39. You've got these nations. Persia, Ethiopia, Put, Gomer with its troops, Betog, Moran, this disputes with this Germany and so forth. These nations. I will put hooks in your jaws, uh, jaws, put hooks in your jaws and draw you into the fight. That chapter says, I'll magnify myself and make myself known in the sight of many nations. That means you have to equate Gog and Magog with the Battle of Armageddon and the Battle of Jehoshaphat, the Valley of Jehoshaphat, when the whole world will turn to Christ, the ones who survived. That's what they have to say. But it's not what the text really suggests, is it? You'll fall on the mountains of Israel, you and your troops, the people who are with you. I'll give you as food to every kind of predatory bird and beast. Does the book of Revelation say that? Yeah. I'll make my name known in the midst of my people Israel. Not let it be profaned anymore. And it goes on and on and on. So they'll bury Gog with all his horde and call it the valley of Hamon Gog. All who pass through the land. Then it goes on. Yes, Israel's restored. I will restore the fortunes of Jacob in verse 25. But what does it say? When this happens, they'll know I'm the Lord. And it says when this happens, that they will be dwelling securely in their own land. Now, you'd have to make the case that the Antichrist will make a false treaty with Israel, but that's not true security. They're not secure. They may be deluded into thinking they're going to be secure, just like with the Oslo Agreement. But it didn't bring any peace. 
the security can only come when Christ dwells. Okay. These armies come when the people are living without walls, without defenses. <laughs> That's what we're told. This is going to happen when there's no walls and there's no defenses. That doesn't appear to match anything that can happen in its totality before the return of Christ. But it matches like a hand in a glove to Revelation chapter 20. The resurrection, dwelling securely in their land, and then the attack of Gog and Magog. I'm not definitively saying there are not two battles of Gog and Magog, but I, what I am saying is it's not mainly what the scripture is talking about. The scripture is talking about what happens at the end of the millennium. Why? Most of you know. Those people born during the millennium will have to choose Christ the way we did. Yeah. Hence, Satan will be unleashed temporarily. But it says Gog, is the Antichrist, the false prophet, are already in the lake of fire. How can you equate the Antichrist with Gog? Now, Gog was an Antichrist. For sure, Gog is an Antichrist. But the Antichrist, this case has not been made well. So we're right back to the same problem. There's arguments for European. There's arguments for a Muslim. But now we see there's arguments that somehow Antichrist will be able to encounter, uh, en encompass a satanic alliance, an amalgamation temporarily. that will include both. As soon as I saw this Abraham Accords, I got nervous. They have this place down there in Abu Dhabi with a church, a mosque, and a synagogue. The Antichrist will bring a false peace to the Middle East, and he will bring a false rapprochement between Jew, Muslim, and Arab. The stage is being set for it. One, they're looking at the wrong Gog and Magog. Something like that may happen. There may be a partial fulfillment, but that's not the main one. The main one will not happen until the New Testament says it is. At the end of the millennium. Secondly, there will be a false peace. I'm not making a political statement, but look how many Christians like Donald Trump. I voted for him twice. I'm not voting for him again because he had that gay gala at Mar-a-Lago and things, but I did vote for him twice. He moved the embassy to Israel. I, you know, he was sympathetic to Christians being persecuted. If Trump had been elected, in my view, when Ukraine war would not be happening. What you see happening in Gaza would not be happening. What happened in Afghanistan would not be happening. These things would not be happening had he been the president. And the economy would be in a lot better shape. But people are stupid. But the Abraham Accords? Jared Kirshner, Jew, son-in-law, negotiated these things. He's an unsaved Jew. Now, they made a big deal of the fact that he used to own the building. In the, I know the building used to be a restaurant on the top called Top of the Sixes. What's the address? 666. I'm not saying that's it. I'm just saying it's noteworthy. <laughs> it's hard to believe it's only a mere coincidence. You understand what's happening with the Abraham Accord? And he's trying to make the peace with the Saudi Arabia. It's not necessarily European or Muslim. There is a third way. But next we're going to look at the next question. Is it a Jew or a Gentile? The arguments both ways. These things are becoming necessary to be understood. 
Deception is rampant. If possible, the elect will be deceived. You've got, he's going to be a European. Oh, it's going to be a Muslim antichrist. And we got this reason. And you got that. We, and they're both saying things that have some weight, apparently. But how do you reconcile the contradictions? Not only between each other, but between them and what Scripture seems to be stating. It's a big question. But it's a question God wants to answer. Not post facto. We have to understand these things when they happen. Anybody can bolt the barn door after the horse escapes. We have to understand these things when it happened. Remember when Jesus came, how many understood? Even the people who understood didn't quite get it. His own mother, John the Baptist, the apostles, even the people who understood didn't quite get it when he came the first time. I mean, they got it, but even the ones who understood didn't have it all worked out. And the road to Emmaus, he had to tell them, didn't he? Now do you see what it said? Now, this is what it meant. Well, it's the same for us. The time to understand these things is now. I do not profess to have it all figured out. But I do know what the Lord has shown me and I stand by it. And if I don't, if I'm teaching you, I'm a false teacher. Let few of you be teachers. I stand by what I tell you. I'm not positive about something, I qualify it. But I do know this, the main Gog and Magog is the one after the millennial reign of Christ. That's what we got to focus on. Because that's what the New Testament says. And I do know that those who argue for a European antichrist have a case to be made, but there are holes in their proposition. And those who argue for an Islamic antichrist have a case to be made, but there is holes in their proposition. The challenge that confronts us is that under the guidance of the Holy Spirit based on the Word of God, we fill in those holes while there is still time to do it. Let's have a break.